Hello students and welcome to this video on uh, your yeast fermentation lab that you did in introductory biology here at TASM. This video is to help you with the CER. It's uh, specially designed for students who are absent or if you had something go wrong with collecting data, etc. You can use this to help uh, you finish the lab. So uh, this is licensed under uh, Common Creatives. It's not meant for uh, anybody to profit from. It's just meant to help students. All of the images are either from my cell phone that I took in class or uh, for me doing this experiment or from Khan Academy, which you can access on KhanAcademy.org. All right, so what is the big picture here? The point of this experiment was for you to uh, think about cellular respiration. And so these uh, yeast, baker's yeast, are going to take sugar, we're going to combine them with water and sugar, and they're going to start eating it. And as they eat the sugar, they're going to use that to divide and uh, do life's processes, and they're going to extract energy from that sugar. So if we look at this equation, here's sugar, uh, glucose. In the presence of oxygen, the yeast are going to do cellular respiration. They're going to produce carbon dioxide, water, and ATP that they can use. That carbon dioxide is going to be uh, given off as foam that we can see rising up in the beaker, etc. You would just breathe it out. Notice how uh, the equation for cellular respiration is the opposite of the equation for photosynthesis. So they're a never ending cycle. Now, after a while, these yeasts are going to run out of oxygen. Think about how crowded it is in there. They're going to use up all the oxygen. Think about if a bunch of you were all put together in a room and it was kind of cut off from outside air, or if there's very little air, it would get hot and you would feel a lack of oxygen. So then they're going to undergo fermentation. And fermentation is the yeast ability to still take sugar or glucose, break it in half and get energy from it and keep producing carbon dioxide. And it works without oxygen. That still produces carbon dioxide so we can still measure it. So what are you really measuring in these beakers or graduate cylinders or whatever you use students was a little bit of aerobic respiration and fermentation. All right, if you wrote about either or on your lab, that's great. Um, and I'm, hope, I'm excited to read it and see it. All right, so here I am uh, wearing a tie, parent teacher conference day, and here's my setup. So I did a bunch of different sugars and the same amount of yeast and same amount of warm water from the warm water bath. And I had similar graduated cylinders and put it together and I was trying to see which sugar affects or promotes the greatest fermentation of the yeast or the most carbon dioxide produced. And it was a pretty surprising result for me. You might have tested this or you might have done pollution or you might have I had one group put plastic bags in there or you could have tried different amounts of yeast or different temperature of the water. There are a lot of different experiments you could have done. And in class this week, we'll share those experiments. And I think that'll be a lot of fun and rewarding for you. So let's see kind of what's going on here. You're going to need to write about this in your reasoning part. And the whole point is for you to think about what the yeast are doing. So if there's oxygen around, the yeast are going to break that sugar in half. That gives them a little bit of energy. And then if there's oxygen around, they'll do the Krebs cycle where they're going to make lots of NADH and FADH2. I call those the taxicabs, the electron carriers. Those electron carriers are then going to go to the electron transport chain. This third part here, you can just remember electron transport chain. When they drop off the electrons, that's going to pump the H pluses or the protons into the intermembrane space. They're going to be able to diffuse back into the matrix through ATP synthase. And as they do that, they'll combine with uh, oxygen and the electrons at the end of the chain. So that would be an H plus, an electron, and oxygen to make water. That makes a lot of ATP for the cell. Eventually, they're going to run out of oxygen. Then they're going to have to do fermentation, which is an anaerobic process. Right? The yeast will die if they can't get energy, so fermentation is better than nothing. Same for you. As you're running around, you would produce lactic acid if you run out of oxygen. So without any oxygen, the yeast are going to do glycolysis. They're going to produce that 2 ATP. And then the problem is, is that they need to make 
we'll come back to this. They need to regenerate NAD+, which will come up in a following slide. All right, so the yeast, when they do this, they're going to produce ethanol or alcohol. And we, when we do this, we produce lactic acid. All right, and eventually your body will be able to get oxygen or the yeast will be able to get oxygen and they'll be able to go back to aerobic respiration. All right, this chart is straight from Khan Academy. I thought it was really good, so that's why I copied and pasted it in here. Why don't you pause the video and see if you can get the reactants, products, locations, stages, and the amount of ATP produced. Um, for something like this on a test in class, I, would, um, I might give you word bank, I might not for this one but it'd be something to think about or study. All right, so for aerobic respiration, you're taking glucose and oxygen. Anaerobic is just glucose, remember no oxygen. The products of aerobic uh, respiration will be energy, water, carbon dioxide. And for anaerobic will be energy, ATP, lactic acid in animals, ethanol and yeast, carbon dioxide and ATP. Where does this happen? It happens, glycolysis always happens in the cytoplasm. And then the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain happen in the mitochondria. For anaerobic respiration or fermentation, it happens just in the cytoplasm. The stages involved include glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, often called the citric acid cycle as well, and then the electron transport chain. Um, they're just using a fancy term here of oxidative phosphorylation which we talked a little bit about in class, but you can just think electron transport chain. Over here, the stages are just glycolysis and fermentation. So in lactic acid fermentation, there's just gonna be one enzyme and in alcoholic fermentation, there'll be two. Notice how aerobic uh, respiration is gonna make a lot more ATP and anaerobic respiration makes a little bit, but remember a little bit is better than none. This is a picture that I gave you in class, and you actually filled in the blanks a little bit on it. Um, the reason I like it so much is it shows cycles within cycles. So here the glucose is getting split. It's going to make a little bit of energy, and it fills up the taxi cabs. It makes NADH. Eventually, the cell is going to run out of empty taxi cabs, or NAD+. So if the cell has run out of NAD+, then all this shuts down, and the cell will die. Not good. So here is what the cell does to regenerate or to make more empty taxi cabs, more NAD+. It has to figure out some way to get rid of the electrons and the hydrogen proton in NADH. So what happens with yeast is first of all, they're going to convert pyruvate, that is what was made from the glucose, into acetaldehyde. That's going to give off carbon dioxide, which you can measure as foam being produced. And then they're going to put onto that acetaldehyde those electrons and the hydrogen, and that's going to make ethanol or alcohol. All right, this all happens in the presence of enzymes. Enzymes are proteins that help to facilitate these reactions. We haven't gone over enzymes in class yet. Um, we're following the California Next Generation Science Standard module and so we just haven't done that yet they'll come up later in the year so you can ignore these over here but if you want to uh, you can learn more about them all right so here was my experiment so i tried like icing sugar and brown sugar and here was like a sweet and low alternative type of sugar so i was trying to figure out how do different types of sugar affect uh yeast fermentation so I'm going to measure it with the foam produced by the yeast. Remember, CO2 is produced during fermentation. So here's my procedures, and notice how I kept everything constant except for the independent variable, or what I was trying to manipulate. I masked five grams of yeast for each figure, five grams of each types of sugar, uh, brown sugar, sucrose, sweet and low icing, and no sugar at all. My control group was no sugar at all, a standard for comparison. If you forgot to make it, then you can use mine as a, uh, a proxy. I added 30 milliliters of warm water, 40 degrees Celsius to each beaker and stirred the contents. If you didn't add warm water, that's okay. It'll be interesting to compare your results. Then I transferred each beaker to a graduated cylinder just so I could really see the amount of foam and then I could measure the milliliters of foam produced. Uh, it, was, it was pretty fun to do, so. 
there we go. Here was my uh, syringe I used to make sure to get the right amount of water. Here is after five minutes is how long I let it run. No sugar and then brown sugar. I was squeezing this in in between parent-teacher conferences, so I didn't have the chance to do any animations or stop videos. So, But it was pretty cool. I was watching out of the corner of my eye rise up. Here are my results. Let me get this out of your way. Well, I'm having a little trouble doing that. But after five minutes, the yeast did not rise at all. Uh, the yeast with no sugar did not rise at all. The other all took off. And the yeast uh, ate up that sugar. They produced a lot of carbon dioxide. So they were doing aerobic respiration, and then they switched over to fermentation. And they all rose the same amount, 65 milliliters of foam. A lot of you in class were talking about the brown sugar did more, et cetera. That's fine. So my last slide here, if my results are different from yours, that's okay. That's science, right? We would want to run this experiment multiple times, a large sample size. What is important is your evidence and your reasoning and your thinking. The actual results I'm not grading you on. So if you got something different, if you got icing sugar, gave out more, that's okay. Maybe your reasoning when you look up the two outside sources, you find that what happened in your experiment wasn't what was predicted. That's okay. You can say there might have been errors in my experimental setup. There were a lot of students. There were only three balances. Maybe we had extra sugar in it. One of the balances broke during the day, and you might have had an incorrect mass reading, and you might have had more sugar in one by accident. It's okay. The whole point is just to get you to work in that claim evidence reasoning framework. I know you did it a lot in middle school if you went here to TASEM. And we also did it with the photosynthesis lab. So I hope you see the method to the teaching and that you're enjoying doing these hands-on activities and we have a lot more coming. All right, students, good luck with your labs. See me for help. I am done coaching middle school volleyball, so I'll be having more after-school help sessions this week and further on. Take care.